Hello, I'm Tony Perkins with Washington Watch. Each day, this program provides a biblical perspective on news, including insightful interviews with elected leaders, newsmakers, and cultural experts. I want to thank you for joining us today. We have a great program coming up, but first, here are some headlines from our friends with FISM News. For FISM News, I'm Samuel Case with your Washington Watch News update for Friday, March 22nd. Well, we'll start with some chaos in Washington, where the House passed its $1.2 trillion spending package today in a vote of 286 to 134, sending it now to the Senate. Congressional leaders released the bill just yesterday, leaving lawmakers only two days to look over and then vote on the 1,000-page measure or face a partial government shutdown. Republican hardliners quickly condemned the package, which funds various parts of the government for the rest of the fiscal year at 2023 levels. Texas Congressman Chip Roy has come out as one of its strongest critics, calling the bill an abomination. I want to be very clear. Any Republican who votes for this bill, they own it, and they are the ones risking the election. It's the people that are going around saying, but oh, we'll cost the election. Oh, but what happens if we have a shutdown? They're the ones running in fear rather than leading. Despite the pushback, House Speaker Mike Johnson is touting the bill as a win, citing cuts to the FBI and increased funding for the border, but that might not be enough to save him from frustrated conservatives. Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene filed a motion today to oust Johnson as Speaker, saying the funding bill is a complete departure from Republican principles. And in other news here, time is now running out for Donald Trump to secure the over $450 million bond needed for his New York civil fraud case, and he's now turning to his supporters for help. Should he fail to get the money in the coming days, the state will begin seizing his assets. And as a result, this week, the Trump campaign sent out a text message saying, quote, I'm calling on one million pro-Trump patriots to chip in and stay, say stop the witch hunt against President Trump. This message message comes as New York AG Letitia James has already taken the very first moves needed to seize Trump's assets. And shifting gears to look at some international news here, top military leaders now say they are concerned about the growing alliance between America's enemies. Testifying before the House Armed Services Committee, CENTCOM Commander General Michael Carrilla highlighted the growing threats posed by the relationship between China, Russia, uh, and Iran. He explained that the Iran country has built up an arsenal of suicide drones through oil sales to China and is now sending those drones to Russia. Meanwhile, the international community is also growing wary of that alliance as well, as last week the G7 released a statement threatening an international response should Iran give Russia ballistic missiles to use in Ukraine. And finally, turning to some rather interesting news in national issues, FISM's Ian Patrick dives into news regarding a national squatting crisis and what's being done about it. It seems that people in the U.S. are increasingly taking advantage of squatters' rights laws, a worryingly growing trend in the nation that has upset entire communities in some instances. The alarming trend has begun to crop up in major U.S. cities as of late. Of note is Atlanta, Georgia, which has seen at least 1,200 examples of unlawfully occupied properties, at least according to the National Rental Home Council trade group. One property was even converted into an illegal strip club, according to the New York Post, an example of how the publication says the squatters are, quote, ruining entire neighborhoods. But the trend has gone so mainstream that even social media influencers are advising illegal immigrants to try it out. One video has made the rounds on social media of a man speaking in Spanish about such laws. Posted to X by the libs of TikTok account, the man says the following, quote, The law says that if the house is abandoned, deteriorated, and in bad shape, we can get it, repair it, and live in it. And, if we can, even sell it. And with that, those are today's headlines from FISM News. Don't forget, you can catch our full show tonight, 5 p.m. Eastern time, on our website, FISMnews.tv. You can also find it on our app as well. All right, with all of that, now stay tuned for Washington Watch with Tony Perkins, and I'll see you on Monday with more news coverage.
From the heart of our nation's capital, here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Watch. I'm Joseph Backholm. I'm a senior fellow for Biblical Worldview and Strategic Engagement. It's my pleasure to be with you this evening on the program today. The stories we're going to cover, the United States, the United Nations rather, took a vote on a ceasefire resolution in the Gaza Strip. What does that resolution mean, if anything, we'll tell you coming up. In addition, in Ireland, two progressive referenda went down to huge defeats. Is this evidence of a growing divide between the elites and the rest of us? We'll talk about that as well. Also, a growing number of voices from within the church are trying to convince Christians the Bible doesn't teach that life begins at conception. Is that true? And why is it so important to many to begin making that argument? We'll talk about that in our worldview conversation coming up later in the program. But first, our headline for today. Earlier today, the House of Representatives advanced a $1.2 trillion package to fund the remaining government departments through fiscal year 2024, but not before a passionate debate on the floor. No Republican in the House of Representatives in good conscience can vote for this bill. It is a complete departure of all of our principles. If this bill were to fail, we are giving carte blanche to the Biden bureaucracy. It is a dramatic improvement. That was Republican House members Marjorie Taylor Greene and Mario diaz Balart. Now, the final vote was 284 to 134, with 112 Republicans and 22 Democrats voting against the six-bill package, which is being called a minibus because it rolls together six of Congress's annual 12 government appropriations bills, rather than all 12, as a more familiar omnibus has done in past years. Now, the ball is in the Senate's court with just hours before a partial government shutdown. Now, how might things unfold? Joining me now to discuss it is Congressman Robert Adderholt, who's a member of the House Appropriations Committee, where he serves as the chairman of the Subcommittee on Labor, Health and Human Services, and Education. He represents the 4th Congressional District of Alabama. Congressman Adderholt, welcome back to Washington Watch. Thanks. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me on. You were a no vote on this bill. Can you tell us why? Well, there were a lot of things in this bill that changed after it went to the Senate. Uh, the House bill that we passed initially uh, was, a, was a pretty good bill. And uh, then it went over to the Senate. And like any bill that we pass in the House, it has to be go to the Senate. Every Senate bill has to come to the House and we have to uh, marry up the differences and try to work <laughs> out the differences. And I felt like this that too much of what Schumer was wanting in this bill, the leader of the Senate, uh, was included in this appropriation bill. And while, you know, Mike Johnson, the current speaker, I think he tried very hard. Uh, I, he was unsuccessful in getting, I think, a lot of the bad things uh, pulled out of this bill. Uh, there were several things that earmarks regarding illegal immigrant services, uh, and a, a birthing hospital, which, as my understanding, actually allows abortions, uh, late-term abortions, to be performed there. And I seriously don't think federal dollars need to be going to either of these things. Any any clinic that helps illegal aliens uh, also helps LGBTQ uh, and uh, also helped also allows abortions to take place. Just just a whole host of things in this bill that was not in the House bill. I know Mike Johnson, the speaker, didn't want to see, but unfortunately the Senate included it. And I was think it was a way for me us to tell the Senate that they can't send over bills like that to the House and expect us to just rubber stamp it. Well, it looks like a lot of Republicans in the House voted for a bill that really they didn't like, and there's not a lot of people eager to defend it. And as you mentioned, it's very different than the bill that the House Republicans drafted and had passed previously. Is this just a scenario where they don't want to be accused of shutting down the government by voting against a bad bill? 
So they just voted yes because it's an election year. And that is that's an election problem you don't want to carry around for the rest of 2024. Is it as simple as that? Well, obviously, closing down the government is a serious thing. And we can't just pretend that that is a simple issue and say, we'll just shut down the government. And so, I mean, he has to go through a long thought process. The speaker and I had many conversations over the last several days about this bill and about what all was included in it. He took the position that uh, if a government shutdown occurred, then we may have to even give more into the Democrats to get it back open. Certainly that is a legitimate argument, and I don't want to uh, say that that is completely irrelevant because that there may be some truth to that. But at the same time, I think that we have to push back on what the Senate sends over, and we've got to make a statement to say that the House is not going to rubber stamp what the Senate sends over, and uh, it may be their earmarks, but we have to pass them in the House of Representatives as well. And so... I just felt like there was too much in this bill at the 11th hour that came from the Senate that I could not in good conscience support. And uh, I, a lot of my colleagues felt the same way. A lot of my colleagues voted no on this bill. And uh, again, I, I always look for a way to vote yes, to try to pass these appropriation bills when possible, but it's somewhere you have to draw the line. And again, there were 134 no votes. 112 of those were from Republicans. But another thing about this bill that seems both normal and concerning is the fact that it was introduced hours before the vote was taken. And to a man and woman within Congress, they would all say, we're supposed to be a deliberative body. We're supposed to actually have accountability and give some sunlight to these issues before we vote on them. But with the threat of the government shutdown deadline looming, it's introduced and then the vote is taken. Is is that just the way it's going to be from now on? Well, I hope not. Uh, we need, I thought it was a mistake to, to rush this bill through. I know that there was a lot of negotiations took place and we didn't get to see the bill until yesterday, uh, but we should have waited at least through the weekend. Obviously, if the go government shuts down over the weekend, most government agencies are closed anyway over the weekend, so it really wouldn't have mattered. And I think that it would have been important to how this vetted to let the conference, let every member of Congress have plenty of time to look at this legislation. So I do think it was a mistake, but obviously you don't want to have the government shutting down. So that is that threats out there as well. That's what Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House is, has a very difficult job. And I, I, I want to yeah. say that he is, I know he's doing his best, uh, but um, obviously uh, I feel like that the Senate really did us wrong, especially uh, the leader of the Senate, Schumer, uh, tried to to uh, interject the Senate's wishes on us without us pushing back. And I think we should have pushed back a little bit harder. And as Speaker Johnson, as a new speaker, he's only been in a few months. And I, as he learns his role as the speaker, I think he's getting better every day at it. I think he, uh, you know, I hope he will learn that he needs to push back harder on the Senate and just put his foot down. And yeah. as I say, I know that's what he wants to do. He's, we have a one, we have a two seat majority right now. And based on the retirement and, his, and one of our colleagues going to be stepping down next month, we'll have a one seat majority. So um, it's a tough job and I don't want to make light of his job. But at the end of the day, I felt like this was a, a no vote. And Congressman, to that point, you mentioned the fact that there is yet another retirement coming before the term ends. Do you have any comment, reflection on why we see why we're seeing so many of these and in a six seat Republican majority that was elected is now down to one seat and conceivably one other person does this. You could get de facto Democrat majority uh, without voters doing anything. Any reflections on what's going on there? Yeah, it's very crazy. This is uh, something that none of us expected, and there were, it's it's almost unheard of to have this many members to step down in the middle of a term. Uh, but uh, right now, there we have such a close 
majority. I think there's a lot of frustration among members, and I think some members are saying, I can do, I can be a more uh, advantage and, and I can be more service somewhere else. But uh, obviously, I think that we've got to stand strong and we've got to stand together. And um, I'm hoping that uh, as we move forward over the next in the spring and in this new year, that we can come together as Republicans and we can stand strong together. We are not unified right now. We need to be unified. And I'm hoping that the speaker can get us unified over the next several weeks and as we move forward in this new appropriations process. We're starting the pro appropriations process anew now, and we're starting with the new appropriations process uh, with the FY25, and we have got to change the way we're doing things. The things we're doing right now is not appropriate, is not right, and I think the American people are getting tired of it, and so that's why I think the status quo is is a failure. And so I'm looking forward to having a chance to try to reform the preparations process and try to do what I can to uh, make the preparations work and be accountable to the members and also to the people we represent. Uh, Congressman, uh, some of the proponents of the bill have said that it cuts funding. Is that true? Is there anything about this that uh, anyone has a reason on, on the on the conservative side to be excited about? There is some cuts, no question. But in and and the House version that you referred to earlier that we passed, there were a lot cut, a lot of cuts. But the these last cuts uh, were were slimmed down after it went to the Senate. And I think that was very devastating to a lot of members, and that's why a lot of members voted no. But we have got to look at reforming the way that we spend money in Washington. And uh, obviously, we can't uh, get the debt paid off with the preparations process. We, we can't have a balanced budget just on the back of the preparations process. However, we can do a lot in trying to make sure that we do our part on the preparations process. And instead of just adding money every year to all the different federal agencies, we got to figure out the agencies that need to be cut and the need the programs that need to be cut. And right now, we're just not doing that. We're just really just looking at all the programs, giving them more money, and then going to the next year, looking at all the programs, giving them more money, and just moving on. Yes. I want to jump in if I can in about 30 seconds. One final question. Representative Marjorie, Ta Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, she filed a motion to vacate Speaker Johnson today. Um, what's the significance of that in your mind in about 30 seconds? Yeah, you know, I, well, I, I, I would be totally against uh, vacating the, the chair right now. Uh, Mike Johnson has been there for what le or six months or less, and he uh, is doing a great job. He has got a very difficult job to do. I'm behind Mike Johnson 100%. Uh, he is a good man. Uh, he is someone that has uh, true Christian convictions, and so I think it would be a real mistake to uh, for him to be removed as speaker at this point. Congressman Robert Adderholt, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. And no truer words were spoken than being Speaker of the House is a very, very difficult job. Coming up next, the U.S.-led resolution calling for a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas in Gaza failed at the U.N. Security Council. We'll talk about it when we come back. Let America rejoice. From coast to coast, let justice reign. Peace reign. Righteousness reign. Lord, let it rain. May the clouds of blessings gush and rain down upon us. Yet even in the clouds, we see the light of your face. Make your face shine on these states, we pray. We pray and then we work. We work in the strength you provide. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Strengthen our hands to do all to God's glory. Whether we eat or drink or vote, everything is holy. So we vote to God's glory. We vote because we can. We vote because we love our nation. We vote because we love our people. The people rejoice when the righteous rule. But when the wicked rule, the people mourn. 
adorn our land with oaks of righteousness. Place men, place women, place those in authority who know their place, who know that they are under authority. Men and women who will stand for the true, for the good, for a more beautiful America. But how can they stand if we don't stand? We must stand. Lift us up. Help us stand. Raise us to that summit, which is yourself. For those you raise to that summit, do not fall. You are able to keep us from falling. Until that day when we do fall, fall before your throne, where our king reigns now. Now, let us rejoice and pray, vote, stand. Amen. Washington Watch. I'm Joseph Backholm, sitting in for Tony today. And earlier today, the United Nations Security Council voted for a fourth time since the start of the war between Israel and Hamas on a resolution calling for a ceasefire. This newest resolution was brought forth by the U.S. and was a major departure from American policy on Israel during the ongoing war. But the resolution failed in the 15-member Security Council with Russia, China and Algeria voting against the resolution and one abstention from Guyana. We were trying to show the international community's sense of urgency about getting a ceasefire tied to the release of hostages, something that everyone, uh, including the countries that vetoed the resolution, should have been able to get behind. That was U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken speaking with reporters today as he was departing Israel. Now, what can we make of this news? Here to delve into it with us is Leela Gilbert, Senior Fellow for International Religious Freedom at Family Research Council. Leela, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Now, first, if you could just tell us a bit more about the resolution itself and what it would have done or would not have done. Well, the resolution was essentially a ceasefire resolution, which was kind of predictable. I think it was less expected coming from the U.S., but uh, it's pr politically understandable. And I think that what we're looking at is a war during an election year and how our uh, American policy may shift about a little more than usual in trying to satisfy everybody with our decisions. And so you know, there was a ceasefire, but there was also, you know, uh, there were other issues involved. And I I think it's just really going to be really hard to follow what our American president and his administration does during this war and how they're going to try to get it over with as quickly as possible as we get closer to the election. And Leila, you mentioned that the, the U.S.'s introduction of this ceasefire resolution at the U.N. Security Council was unusual. We saw something really unusual earlier this week as well when Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer called for a new election in Israel, which is a unusual step to, to essentially call for the removal of the leadership of one of our allies, and of course, our biggest ally in the Middle East. What are the political implications, what's going on politically that's leading to this departure from individuals and from our State Department on these issues? 
Yeah, it was really kind of shocking to hear that, although it's it's been clear from the beginning of the war, which was, we have to remember what happened on October 7th, which was the absolute genocide, the most brutal killing of Israeli women, children, babies. It was unbelievably bad. That's not in front of people anymore. What's in front of them now is the continuing efforts of the IDF to clean Hamas out of Gaza, which is, that was the reason this all happened was because it was a Hamas operation. So what we're looking at now is how that interfaces with the upcoming election. And I think that we just have to remember that's part of the game. And we've shifted from, you know, tears and sorrow coming from our U.S. government to now this kind of nudging, trying to find ways to put a stop to the war. And the Israelis want to remove Hamas from Gaza. It's clear that they are a bloodthirsty jihadist group and they aren't good neighbors, <laughs> to put it mildly. So I think it's a, it's a real conflict of interest that we're, we're looking at, Joseph. Well, and we have seen in the recent uh, primary elections that there are many Democrat voters in the swing states, Michigan being the biggest example, who have gone into the ballot booth and voted for an unspecified, kind of an other candidate rather than Joe Biden. And, and the campaign around that effort has really been to signal from the portion of the electorate that is kind of anti-Israeli and sympathetic to Hamas, that uh, we are not going to vote for President Biden if he takes Israel's side on this issue. Do you think that entirely or significantly or somewhat explains kind of the half measures that the Biden administration is taking, saying, yeah, we support Israel, but stop as soon as you can? I think it's 100% influencing the way things are going the closer we get to election time. And yes, it was in Michigan. I think the the biggest direction was towards some protesters in Michigan that were essentially drawing the line you mentioned. And so there's been an effort to kind of swing back and forth. You know, the war continues and now the focus is on, you know, famine amongst the victims who are Innocent, I don't know how innocent, but many of the people that are stranded in in um, the cities that are being uh, looked at now are, you know, they're def definitely going to be sidelined and sometimes injured and maybe some killed. So we have to be compassionate about that. But on the other hand, we know that right now they're looking at the center of where Hamas has its headquarters in Gaza. So, you know, there's going to be a real conflict of interest here. And I hope that America has the presence of mind to see that there's no reason to protect Hamas, period. It's doing nothing for the good people in Gaza, yeah. the ordinary citizens. It's not good for anyone. And yeah. so, you know, they're under the they're under their thumb for sure. But I think it's important for us to realize they need to be gone and anything we can support that's not you know, genocide, which it never will be with the Israelis, and that's not the way they do things. I think we should support right. every effort to clean house in these cities and get rid of as much as Hamas is as possible. It's very concerning that there would be political pressure in the United States to be sympathetic to terrorist organizations. That development is new and it's deeply troubling. But Leela, in about 30 seconds, is this going to have any impact on what Israel actually does? Well, Israel has to be careful about being blatantly offensive. But I think right now, Netanyahu has been down this road before. I trust him to make wise decisions and to do what he can to protect the Israeli people from another Hamas attack. Leela Gilbert, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That story is not going away. Just the way that this conflict between Israel and Hamas is exposing our ultimate allegiances and our understanding of what right and wrong is. It's a short term and long term, very significant for that region and for the West in general. Uh, stay with us. Coming up next, two significant referenda from Ireland that were surprising defeats for the left. What does that mean? We'll tell you about it when we come back right here on Washington Watch.
Thank you again for these dear friends and those who serve, who you've called here to serve. We've heard their hearts this morning, God. I pray that you encourage them. I pray that you give us all wisdom, discernment, stamina to do the things that you have called us to do. And as Solomon asked, and as we repeat, Lord, that you would give us the courage to walk in your ways, to follow your commands, and to stand for truth so that we can govern and administer justice in a way that is pleasing and honorable to you. We ask and pray and believe all this in Jesus' name. Amen. by which we must be saved, the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the light of the world, the glory of Israel, the only answer, the only hope America has that it might yet again shine as a city on a hill. No revival comes without repentance. So God, we pray that we would own our own sin. God, that we'd walk before you in constant revival. What have we done to our children? We are teaching them that there's no God and that they can define good and evil. Lord, have mercy on us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would commission us to go and make your word known and your truth to a world that is in desperate need of that truth and that hope. Lord, I pray that we would answer the call and say, here we are. Send us in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm Joseph back home sitting for Tony. So glad that you are with us. While the latest budget bill demonstrates the Biden administration's desire to continue full speed ahead to the left, recent referendums in Ireland show that country is moving in a different direction, and perhaps the public there has had enough. Now, one referendum called the Family Amendment would have, ironically, eliminated language from their constitution saying that family is founded on marriage. 67% of Irish voters voted to keep that language in their constitution. The second referendum, known as the Care Amendment, sought to remove language stating that, quote, by her life within the home, woman gives to the state a support without which the common good cannot be achieved, end quote. 75% of Irish voters voted to keep this language, despite concerns from the left that it was gendered and no longer appropriate. Now, what does it all mean? Is there anything we can learn about the mood of the U.S. based on these decisions in Ireland? Joining me now from Ireland to break it all down is Sam McCarthy. He's a news writer at the Washington Stand. Sam, good to see you today. Joseph, great to be on the show. Good to be talking with you. What do you think is the lesson we should learn from the results of these two referendums? I think really what's key to understand is that family, and in particular the referenda demonstrate the role of the mother, are crucial. They are foundational. You know, we, we understand, particularly as Christians, that the family is the basic unit of society. It's not necessarily the individual, though the individual is, of course, a component, but it's the family that's the basic unit of society. That's really what welds the society together, and marriage and the family in particular are the first society, you could say. The very first thing we know from Genesis that God named not good was loneliness. And so he created man and wife, husband and wife for one another in order, and their first commission was to start a family. And so I think that really the referenda results demonstrate that even in a, a largely liberalized or secularized progressive nation like Ireland, even here, we recognize that there's uh, a fundamental value and good to the family and that it is essential for society. Yeah. Sam, 
I can't help but wonder where these came, where these ideas came from and how they got on the ballot in the first place. There doesn't seem to be a substantive change to the law that would really change how people live. Was this really just a virtue signal that the public kind of saw through and said, you know, we're not interested in minimizing the significance of, for example, mothers in the home? I think that that would be at least partially correct. You have Ireland culturally and socially in particular has tried to kind of play catch up with a lot of the more progressive nations, particularly in Europe, but progressive Western nations over the past couple of decades. Ireland was or longly for a long time. Ireland was a politically a very conservative nation, uh, largely due to the influence of the Catholic Church. It's been a very politically conservative nation for a long time. And if you look at uh, other referenda, like in 2015, they legalized same-sex marriage. In 2018, they decriminalized abortion. They've kind of been trying to play catch up and they've crammed, I think, too much into too little a time period. And so I think that these referenda, these recent referenda at any rate, it really was just a bridge too far to some extent. Now, it's my understanding that there was essentially no campaign against these efforts, and the results of them as a result were pretty shocking. How do you interpret the fact that all of the kind of elite establishment energy and money was in support of these referenda, yet the public rejected them as soundly as they did? Yeah, you really had no organized campaign for a no, no vote necessarily. You had some of the independent and minor parties, like the Irish Freedom Party, for example, campaigning for a no, no vote. And you had some independent individuals like Senator Michael McDowell, uh, who were campaigning for a no, no vote. But you had all of the big guns in the government. You had all the NGOs, the non-government organizations. You had the Taoiseach Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar. Uh, all of his chief government ministers, a lot of the leading Fine Gael party, you had all of them campaigning for yes votes. And so I think really it's, the, as I noted, it's kind of a resounding rejection of the progressive liberal agenda that's been pushed a little bit too far and too fast in Ireland. Now, Sam, you mentioned there Tishak Varadkar, who uh, we would refer to as maybe the prime minister. He has subsequently resigned. Uh, how relevant is that? And, and notably, he is uh, the first openly gay Tishak in Ireland. How relevant is the, the results from these ballot measures uh, to his resignation? I don't think that it's any accident that his resignation follows essentially two weeks after the referenda results. These were seen as uh, a strong rebuke against the reigning government coalition, uh, which is right now headed by Varadkar's party, Fine Gael. And it's been seen also as sort of a, a personal slap in the face almost to Varadkar, who kind of spearheaded uh, these referenda, these constitutional amendment propositions and heavily, heavily campaign for them. We've also seen calls for the resignation of other individuals like the children's minister, Roderick O'Gorman, who's also openly gay. You now have a number of the top cabinet ministers in Ireland are openly gay. They all promote the LGBT agenda, which as we know is anti-family. And so you've seen it as kind of a rebuke against them and their agenda. I don't think that it's any accident at all that his resignation followed so closely behind the referenda results. Well, Sam, I'm curious to see if this is just a general global movement against kind of what the elites are looking for by the general public. We're going to have a chance to measure that in this side of the pond soon. But Sam McCarthy, thank you so much for your time today. Coming up next, David Clausen from the Center for Biblical Worldview joins me for a worldview conversation. Stay with us. Hello, I'm Tony Perkins, President of Family Research Council. Sometimes the headlines are overwhelming and it feels like we're alone and there's nothing we can do. That is exactly what the enemy wants us to believe. Reading through the Bible, there are many things that are counterintuitive. One of them is that God never uses a majority. It is always a minority devoted to the truth. Here at Family Research Council, we're grateful to stand side by side with other believers for the truth. And as a result, God is making a difference. When you partner with us, you're joining with Christians around the nation and standing together for the truth of God's word. 
supplying pastors, parents, and school boards with training and resources to stand up against the indoctrination of your children. I invite you to become a STAND member and stand with FRC today. Together, with God's help, we can preserve freedom for the next generation. Go to frc.org and become a STAND member today. Again, that's frc.org. Stand with us. Research has found that there are 59 million American adults who are a lot like you. There are millions of people around the country who are born again, deeply committed to practicing their faith, and believe the Bible is the reliable Word of God. But that's not all. They're also engaged in our government. They're voters. They're more likely to be involved in their community, and they're making a difference in elections. The problem is that a lot of them feel alone, too. We want to change that. FRC wants to connect these 59 million Americans to speak the truth together, no matter the cost. If you want to learn more about this group and what it means to be a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative, or if you want to find out if you are one of these sage cons yourself, join us. Go to frc.org slash s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. That's s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. I'm Tony Perkins, and I have a prediction. This year, there will be uncertainty and continued political and cultural division. Okay, so that's not that startling of a prediction. But try this. We can have peace and even joy amid the chaos. Jesus said in John 15, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus told us there would be days like this so that our eyes would be upon him and his promises rather than our circumstances. Now, how can we keep our eyes on Jesus? Abide in Him by being in His Word. At Family Research Council, we want to help you do that, which is the reason for the Stand on the Word Bible Reading Plan. With just 10 to 15 minutes each day, you will have read the entire Bible in just two years. But most importantly, you'll be abiding in Him daily, living in His joy and peace in these trying times. Join me on this journey through the Bible. Go to frc.org slash Bible for more. Back to Washington Watch. I'm Joseph back home, sitting in for Tony today. A provocative opinion piece in Politico magazine hit the web yesterday. It's titled, Why Christians and Republicans Should Reconsider the Premise That Life Begins at Conception. The author of the piece is Bradley Onishi, a professor of religion and a former youth pastor who now co-hosts the Straight White American Jesus podcast. He's also author of a book titled Preparing for War, the Extremist History of White Christian Nationalism and What Comes Next. Now, in the political article, he makes the argument that are being made more often and more enthusiastically in recent months and years. The Bible isn't really pro-life. Is that true? Why are they making these arguments? Because they want you to feel good about voting for people who support abortion, of course. But is it true? Is the Bible not pro-life? Have we really been confused all this time, and is God really indifferent to the issue of abortion. Joining me now for this discussion is my colleague at the Center for Biblical Worldview, David Clausen. He's the director of FRC Center for Biblical Worldview. David, good to see you today. Good to be with you, Joseph. Now, before we get into the conversation, I kind of want to lay uh, a little foundation here for how common this argument is. And I mentioned this Onishi article in Politico, but uh, Joe Scarborough recently made a similar point on his show. Let's go ahead and play that clip. I know you don't want to hear it out there, but stay with me because it is the truth. They invented the issue of abortion. Mm -hmm as a religion, not just as a political issue, but Jerry Falwell, Richard Vigory, a Republican operative, and Paul Ryrick, a direct mail specialist, Republican, they said, we're going to create abortion, not just as a political issue, we're gonna make it a religious issue. David, that's Joe Scarborough. And now I wanna read 
a clip, which is uh, an excerpt and just a, a representation of a similar argument that he makes. He says, quote, in fact, within the lifetime of many of today's evangelical Christian believers, their churches either supported abortion rights or were neutral on it. In the 1960s and 1970s, Southern Baptists and other historically conservative Protestant denominations held that abortion was not only permissible, but also should be left to individual choice. And so, David, is it true that this whole idea that the Bible is pro-life, that life begins at conception, was created somewhat recently just for political purposes? Absolutely not, Joseph. For for 2,000 years, uh, the church has been pro-life. And why has the church been pro-life for 2,000 years? It's because the Bible is pro-life. Uh, uh, Joseph, what's absent uh, from the Politico article, what's absent from Joe Scarborough's analysis, is actually any reference to the Scripture. Uh, they, they never even quote a single verse. And there's a reason they don't quote a single verse, Joseph, is because if they were to open up the Scripture, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, you would see that the Bible is pro-life from cover to cover. And the church got that right for basically 2,000 years. Um, from the first century, one of the very first moral ethics books, the Didache, uh, that early Christians used, Joseph, it literally says, you shall not murder a child by abortion, nor kill that which is begotten. Other church theologians, whether it's Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Augustine, Ambrose, Jerome, the, the list goes on as far as the early patristics. Even when you get to the Reformation, folks like Martin Luther, John Calvin, uh, it's really just of a who's who of church history uh, that weighed in on this issue, and they consistently said the Bible is pro-life. And so that's really important. We live in an age that's biblically and historically illiterate. And so when people like Joe Scarborough and this political Politico writer say these things, well, it, it sounds intelligent. They, they sound like they're making arguments based in reason and fact, but they're not. And one other point that should be made, Joseph, it is true uh, that some denominations, uh, noticeably the Southern Baptist Convention in the 19, early 1970s, late 1960s, were pro-abortion. Uh, but those were the leaders of those denominations, uh, those who were leading the seminaries, those who were leading the entities. And when actual Southern Baptist rank and file uh, began to find out what their leaders believed, well, guess what? That's when you had the conservative resurgence led by folks like Adrian Rogers in 1979 that drove all of those pro-abortion theologians out of the denomination within about a decade. So I think we actually need to have some historical context when we make these arguments. Well, digging a bit more into this Onishi article, he actually cites people like Augustine and Aquinas for his argument that uh, there has actually been toleration for abortion historically. What's your response to that specifically? Yeah, so the argument that he's making is that throughout the church, there's been specifically the argument that he raises in the article, there's been a distinction between pre and post quickening uh, and that uh, pre-quickening, so quickening, you know, the moment uh, that a mother can feel movement, fetal movements, uh, uh, that prior to that moment, the church was actually uh, said kind of morally neutral. Well, Joseph, here's one quote actually from Augustine uh, where he makes this distinction. He did make this distinction, and we have to realize he's writing in the fourth century. He doesn't have the same scientific knowledge that we have. But even then, he's actually, well, here's what he says. He says, indeed, it's a lustful cruelty uh, to use extravagant measures to destroy the conceived seed by some means previous to birth, preferring that its offspring should perish rather than, excuse me, that its offspring should rather perish than receive vitality, or if it was advancing to life within the womb, should be slain before it was born. What's interesting there, Joseph, he's making the distinction between pre and post quickening. Uh, pre quickening would be uh, that they would perish rather than receive vitality. Post quickening would be, well, they're advancing to life within the womb. What he says actually in both of those cases, pre or post quickening, he says it's a extravagant method and a lustful cruelty to destroy conceived seed. 
what's interesting, Joseph, common law uh, practitioners, uh, folks like uh, Matthew Hale, William Blackstone, uh, Henry Bracton, uh, these are people writing in the uh, 14, 15, 1600s, they also made a distinction uh, between pre-quickening and post-quickening. And they did make distinctions uh, for both of those cases, but they did say that even abortion and pre-quickening was still, even if it wasn't murder, it was a heinous crime. Uh, that's the language that all common law theorists use. They said pre-quickening abortion was still a heinous crime, even if it didn't amount to murder. And so this idea that there's this squishy, middle, moral, neutral uh, going on, uh, that actually, when you look at the common law theorist and you look at folks like Augustine, it doesn't add up and it doesn't measure up to the arguments put forth by this writer. You know, David, before I saw this article, I don't think I had even contemplated the significance or meaning uh, of quickening in a very, very long time. And I think in my own mind, I would have dismissed it as kind of a relic of an age where we didn't understand scientifically what was going on inside the womb. And I can understand why like a medieval mind would think, oh, this might be the moment when a, an unborn person becomes alive because now they're moving and maybe they just now have life. Uh, we now know better. This seems to me to also be suggesting that, well, you know, 600 years ago, we didn't know the difference between death and a coma. And therefore, uh, because we were making that distinction 600 years ago, uh, we don't need to, you know, we, we can we can determine whether somebody in a coma is dead or not now. Um, is this really a theological matter or is it more just a scientific matter? And we just need to realize, you know, we now have better information. So we can't be drawing arbitrary distinctions like those with less information did and refer to it as quickening. No, I think that's absolutely right, Joseph. And so absolutely some of these early theologians, uh, first of all, they, they were doctors. Uh, they, they weren't medical men. Uh, but when they did weigh in on this, they were, they were looking at it theologically. And again, going to the first century, they condemned abortion unequivocally. Uh, as more and more scientific advancements have happened, uh, what's interesting, even in our own country, Joseph, uh, the modern pro-life movement actually started in the 19th century. Uh, in the 1860s, 1870s, uh, the people who led that movement actually weren't um, clergy members. They weren't pastors or priests. They were actually uh, doctors. Uh, who were the first woman to win, to earn a, a doctorate uh, in America. Uh, she actually wrote a book on this. And uh, she, she was saying, you know, once uh, when people realized the medicine, they realized the science of embryology, they, they realized the stages of fetal development. Well, my goodness, this is a, a person uh, that deserves, that has moral standing and deserves legal recognition. And so it was actually doctors uh, who pleaded with clergy members uh, to make sure that their theology lined up with good science. Uh, I think it's an incredible part, actually, of the pro-life history of, this own, of our own nation. You know, you've done a good job of addressing the idea that this was not just invented by Jerry Falwell in the 1970s. Uh, this position that life begins at conception was not just invented by Jerry Falwell in the 1970s in order to leverage it as a political issue. Uh, but there's another quote here that I think puts this broader conversation into context and help us understand why this argument is being made in the first place. And again, I'm going to read from the Onishi article in Politico. He says, Quote, conservative Catholic and Protestant theologians will argue either that contrary to these passages, other works by Augustine and Aquinas reveal a belief that life begins at conception or that these theological giants were simply wrong on this, this issue. But this is the point exactly. There is a widespread and nuanced theological debate about the beginning of life in the history of Christianity. The idea that life begins at conception is far from a universally agreed upon matter of historical doctrine, Christian doctrine, and when viewed in the long history of the Christian tradition, it is actually a minority opinion. Now, understanding that what his conclusion was there, that this is an actually in a minority opinion, is factually not true. I think there's something important to recognize here is that more broadly than just dealing with this issue of abortion, this is happening from the left within the church on many different issues pertaining to the sexual revolution. And what they do is he, he doesn't argue that scripture is clear 
that life does not begin in a, a conception and that God is okay with abortion. He doesn't make that argument. What he cites is, oh, well, there is disagreement and there is a debate. Therefore, we can't really know. And it seems to me that across all of these issues, the primary point is not to convince people that God likes homosexuality or that God likes transgenderism or that God likes abortion, just that because people are debating it, you can't actually know what God thinks. Therefore, just do what you think is best, and we will tell you what is best, which is a fairly cynical political move rather than a theological one. Do you think that's a fair synopsis of why these arguments are being made uh, in the beginning of an election year in 2024, when, of course, everybody has a motive to either turn out their voters or suppress the other side? I'm not at all surprised, Joseph, that these types of articles uh, and then what we saw with Scarborough's commentary that it's happening in a contentious presidential election. I, I think it's helpful, especially for our Christian listeners and viewers, to realize kind of the, the spiritual nature of this. You know, a lot of what a lot of these arguments are doing, uh, they're really trying to go at uh, the authority of Scripture. Uh, they're really trying to undermine uh, the Bible. It, it reminds me of what the serpent actually said in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say? Uh, and uh, did God really have, does God really have an opinion on life? Life. Does he really have an opinion on sexual ethics? And look at all the debate that's happening in the areas of philosophy and whatnot. And so there really is no thus saith the Lord. Well, Joseph, there's a lot of issues that Christians uh, can debate. There's secondary and tertiary issues uh, that at the end of the day we can agree to disagree on. Uh, but there's a lot of clear issues where we don't have to guess what God's opinion is. We don't have to guess what his view on life is. We have Psalm 139 and Luke 1. We don't have to guess what his view on sexual ethics is. We have Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, uh, Ephesians 5. We have clear text. We have a thus saith the Lord. And so I think it's absolutely crucial. Uh, in an election year, but any year, uh, to realize that when the Bible, when it seems like the Bible is really clear, Joseph, in most of those cases, it actually is really clear, and we can trust God and we can trust His Word. Yeah, and very often when there is the appearance of ambiguity and people are trying to create the appearance of ambiguity, it's just because they don't want to believe what it appears that the Bible has said, and in the goal then is to create this ambiguity so that I can make the decision for myself and have cover to say, well, God didn't tell me clearly enough, so it's just up to me. And David, if we are leaving it up to ourselves because we can't know what God thinks, functionally, that doesn't make us different thinkers than the pagans, does it? No, it doesn't. And I think that's why uh, what we do here at FRC is so important is helping people realize the importance of a biblical worldview, understanding how that biblical meta narrative of creation, fall, redemption, yeah. consummation uh, not only affects our life on Sundays, but affects our life Monday through Saturday as well. And so, yeah, we don't want to be functional pagans. We want to actually be followers of Christ who are being discipled by the Word of God yeah. and living that out with every issue. Yeah. Are we submitted to our own will? Or are we submitted to God's will? Now, in fairness, there are some questions that are difficult to answer. And if we just don't know, then we just don't know. And, and God is very clear that there are some things we can't know on this side of eternity because we have limited knowledge. But we can search our own hearts and know, is it my desire to submit my will to God's? Or is it my desire to create a God that is submitted to my will, that's been fashioned in my image? And that's the difference between a disciple and uh, an, an idol. David Clawson, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Joseph. And friends, thank you for joining us here on Washington Watch. It's been my pleasure to be with you. Look forward to having you back on Monday. Until then, fear God and nothing else. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234.